Hello. Welcome to this PowerPoint presentation. You are hearing me talk. You're going to want to get out some paper to take some notes. Since you're watching this on a screen, it's probably difficult to type. So probably better to take some notes or figure out some way you can get notes from this. There will be a quiz on this, and you will get to use your notes. We're going to start with the definitions of the word epic, because the Odyssey is an epic poem, and that means something specific. Now, if you look up the definition of the word epic, you'll see that it means very imposing or impressive, surpassing the ordinary, especially in size or scale, like an epic voyage, something of heroic proportions. I think we use the word epic now more colloquially in conversation. Oh, that movie was epic. Did you see that? That was epic. But when we say that, we do mean the same thing. We mean it was impressive. It surpassed the ordinary. An epic poem, then, is a long narrative poem that tells of heroic deeds that surpass the ordinary on some kind of incredible voyage. And a, a long narrative poem means it's a, sh it's a story, but it's told in poetic form. So that's what I need you to know about an epic poem and what makes this epic. Now, constituting or having to do with or suggestive of a literary epic is what we call the epic tradition. In literature, in film, in other art, there is an epic tradition. Now, epics often start in the middle. In Latin, this is known as uh, in medius res, three words, en medius res. What this means is that the story is nonlinear. It doesn't start with exposition, rising action, everything else. It doesn't start at the beginning. It starts somewhere in the middle. Keep in mind that in ancient Greek times, poets would have been entertaining 20,000 people in an open-spaced arena who had nothing to do but just listen to these poets recite from memory these epic poems. Now, considering that form of entertainment, why do you think epics often start in the middle? Why would an epic poem start en medias res? I'll give you a moment to think about it and then write down a guess. Now, the Trojan War starts a little bit before that. <clears throat> We've talked about Xenia, the ancient Greek value of hospitality. I introduced briefly Nostos, which is homecoming. I talked about oikos briefly. Oikos, just like the yogurt brand, oikos means family. But we're going to talk about four concepts highly regarded by the ancient Greeks above all else. And that would have been love, as in romantic love, marriage, and how one acted appropriately in marriage, wisdom, the ability to uh, creatively and efficiently and intelligently uh, solve problems and conflicts, and war. And these four were considered so important that if one pursued them and had them, they were godlike. That's how highly the Greeks regarded these four things. Now, speaking of that last one, war, the Trojan War has its roots in the marriage between Peleus and Thetis. You see, Peleus and Thetis had a big wedding, and they invited every single god and goddess and nymph except one. Now, the one they didn't invite, you could probably understand why. Now, who knows if they didn't invite this one because they ran out of room or they didn't have enough invitations left or they just couldn't afford it, but probably it's something else. You see, the one goddess they didn't invite is named Eris, E-R-I-S. And Eris is the goddess strife, discord, rivalry, 
and contention. So you're having this wedding and it's celebration and it's love and all our friends and the gods and goddesses and it's dancing and it's just great. So you're not going to invite discord into your wedding on purpose. This is like not inviting that person to your birthday or to a party or to a wedding or something that you know is going to crash it and just be horrible and create problems for everybody. You intentionally leave that person out. So they intentionally left Eris out. But she's the goddess of discord. So what did she do? She crashed the party. Well, she tried to. She shows up, tries to get in. The guards outside don't let her in. And because she's the goddess of discord, she creates some by throwing a golden apple over the gate. And it lands on the big feasting table everyone's at. And it says, to the fairest on it. It means whoever gets the apple is the fairest, is the most beautiful in the world. And immediately, three goddesses reach for it. Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite. Now Zeus is there, and he looks at this, and they all everybody turns to Zeus, you know, king of the gods, and he goes, huh, I want no part of this. So he bails on the choice, and it's left to Paris, who is the prince of Troy and sort of the ruling um, mortal, also very handsome in all the artwork uh, and myth. Paris has to choose. So all three decide to use their powers to promise him things. Hera promised Paris, promises Paris power like he's never known before over the dominion of mortals. Athena promises him that she'll use her wisdom to get him well beyond anything he could dream about. And Aphrodite thinks, well, I'm the goddess of love. I got this. She promises Paris the heart of the most beautiful mortal woman in the world. And Paris thinks about it. He chooses love. He chooses Aphrodite. She gets the apple. Now, if we pause for a moment here and we consider what this would mean, let's not even talk about Paris in terms of what this says about him, but if we're going to do some cultural mining and put on our headlamps and everything. The Greeks have a story where a person is given the choices between unlimited power, unlimited wealth, and the love of a beautiful woman. And the one that wins is a love of a beautiful woman. So what does that tell you about what this ancient culture was thinking and valuing right now? Here is a picture of uh, a painting, rather, of the wedding of Peleus and Thetis. And if you will notice and look up and kind of to the left, you'll see somebody throwing an apple. So Paris picks Aphrodite. He goes to Sparta, where King Menelaus is marrying Helen. Helen is considered by everyone the most beautiful woman that's ever been created who's mortal in the history of existence. And she and Menelaus are getting married, and Paris shows up, and he's got Aphrodite and Aphrodite's son, Cupid, and they make Helen fall in love, but she doesn't even get a choice, she just does, with Paris, and Paris snatches her, and they run away where he lives, which is all the way across the sea in Asia, to Troy. And King Menelaus now is left without his wife. And he yells for revenge and rescue and let's go to war with the Trojans. I'm getting my woman back. Agamemnon, help me out, bro. Agamemnon, great king, great Greek warrior, also Menelaus' brother. He says, I got you, bro. 
Let me just get some crew together. We will get this done. I will get your woman back. We will kill and slaughter people. I got this. We like war. Anyway, we're good at it. So, he hooks up with Odysseus. That's a picture of him from one of the movies. He connects with Achilles, who was played by Brad Pitt in the movie Troy. Now, side note, please do not ever watch this film. It is an abysmal three hours of your life that you will never get back. I mean, I'm still waiting for an apology from the director at this point, but you will waste your time watching this just disgustingly terrible film with Brad Pitt and Orlando Bloom as Paris. It's, it's so bad and over the top and awful. Do almost anything but watch this film. Menelaus, of course, uh, the Greek Nestor, the great hero Ajax, a couple of these others. There's, of course, way, way more. Um, now, Odysseus is the king of Ithaca. Menelaus, king of Sparta. So they're all Greeks, but they get to rule over separate areas. So they each kind of have their own people and own place, and they have their own ships with their own guys. So when Agamemnon goes to get help, he's not only getting Odysseus. He's getting Odysseus, if he goes, and all of Odysseus's guys on, like, ships galore. So this is like a big, huge thing he's gathering. So here's a map. And if you just look at the arrow, and you can see where it points Troy. Now, if I go all the way down the arrow back to where the arrow starts, I get to a place that looks kind of like Aeolus. I want you to go straight left or west, and then you'll see Ithaca. That's where Odysseus lives with his wife, Penelope, and their brand new baby son, Telemachus. Now, if you go south from Ithaca, one orange dot, and then to the right, you'll see Olympia. And then if I go a little bit further right and a little bit south, I get Sparta. That's where Menelaus is. Now, the Trojans on their side, they have Paris, who's the prince of Troy. They have the great Trojan hero, Hector. They have the king, Priam, the king of Troy, Paris' uh, dad. And they've got Aeneas, another great Trojan, Trojan soldier. Now, when Agamemnon gets his bros together and all his guys, the problem is they don't want to go. Odysseus has got a wife, Penelope, he's got a kingdom to rule, and oh yeah, he's got a baby. And the problem is, you see, he made this promise. Because all the guys wanted Helen, and they all fawned over her, they all flirted with her, and they all loved her so much that they made a promise that if she was ever in need, that whoever she married, they would go help that guy. So when Odysseus gets the message from Hermes that he's got to go fight and honor his promise, he's got a tough sell there. He's got to say to his, brand, his, his wife, Penelope, who's just given birth, Honey, honey, hi. Um, funny thing, um, I got to go. It's this little thing with a, a war I got to go fight. Um, but you know what? I, I'm, I'm king. And you're the queen, and we've got servants, and we've got maidens, and we've got maids, and, and we've got nurses to help you. You're going to be totally fine, and I'm, I'm barely going to be gone. You're, you're not even going to notice me gone. Um, I, I do have to take a bunch of our ships and, and all the basically the best soldiers that we have. But besides that, you know, it's like, I, I, it's like I'm not even going to be gone. What's that? Why? Um... You know, uh, I, 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 you know, my word, my word is bond, and um, I wouldn't be a good king and 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 a good Greek if I if I didn't honor my word that I gave to the woman I met before you. Anyway, gotta go. Bye. So Odysseus goes, um, and so do all the others because honor is important, and we have to. Uh, our word is our bond. So they all go to Troy, and the city of Troy um, is fortified with a really high wall. 
So when the Greeks land there, they just decimate the area around the coast and some of the nearest islands there. And those are all allies to Troy. And the Greeks just lay waste to them and destroy them. But they have a major problem with Troy because it just has this giant wall and they can't penetrate it. And so the war goes on for nine years. And the Greeks just pitch their tents on the beach and fight with their ships docked and the Trojans fight from behind their wall and it's this giant stalemate that lasts nine years. Now, you should know also that Troy is a real city. It did really exist. It was the crown jewel of Asia at the time. And archaeologists have dug and found um, all the remnants and uh, uh, artifacts of the city and what it was. There was a great tremendous world-changing war between major forces that did inspire the story of the Trojan War. After nine years, at this point, the great Trojan hero Hector, he's dead. Achilles, Hector killed him with an arrow shot in Achilles' heel, hence why we call it the Achilles' heel. Paris is dead. So after nine years, in the tenth year, Odysseus has this idea. Now remember, he's he's known for many things, and one of the things he's known for among all of his Greek fellows is his wisdom, his metis, M-E-T-I-S, that Greek concept of metis, his wisdom. So he has this idea. He goes, all right, guys, look. Let's build a giant wooden horse. Now, now, hear me out, 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 okay? We're going to build a giant wooden horse, and it's going to be hollow inside, huh? Huh? What? Nobody wants to do this? Who's got a better idea? No one? That's what I thought. Shut up and listen. Okay. Here's what we do. We build this giant horse. We make it look like all of us are leaving. We burn our tents. We send the ships away, but meanwhile, me and a couple other guys hide in the belly of the horse, and we get the Trojans to bring the horse inside. And yeah, now you're picking up what I'm putting down. And then, at night, when they least suspect it, we'll get a signal. I don't know how yet. Just wait. We'll get a signal, and then we'll jump out, open the gates, let everybody else in, and we'll kill everyone and win the war. Tell me this isn't brilliant. And no one has any better idea. So they set to building a giant horse. Now, I always picture this. They get all this lumber from somewhere and all this wood and all these supplies and all these hammers, rocks, whatever. And they build this massive horse. And the Trojans are just watching from behind their wall. Like, do they see this horse being built? And are they wondering what's going on? Or... I don't know. That part's confusing to me. But we're not supposed to ask those questions in mythology, right? So I shouldn't even ask them. Now, there's a Greek guy named Sinon. And Sinon is the only one left with the horse. So they burn all their tents. So it looks like they're gone. They send a, some of their guys on their ships, and they sail them off the coast of Troy, and they hide them behind some nearby islands. So it looks like they've left. And... The Trojans look at this, and they see the burnt uh, tents, and they see the ships gone, and they just see this giant horse on the beach. So they think, I, okay, I guess we won. So they open the gates, and they go down, the king and um, a couple of his uh, still alive uh, confidants, and uh, a couple of seers, because you never can have too many good seers. And looking at this giant horse, thinking, um, I don't know. Do we do we burn it? Do we do we keep it? Um, we are the Trojans, and the horses are our thing. We do have them as emblem on all our armor. Um, so we could we could definitely use it for our theme of horse. We have a horse theme going on in Troy. Um, and Laocoon, Laocoon is a seer, and Laocoon looks at us and goes, No, 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 no. This is a terrible idea. This is a terrible idea. I'm calling BS. This is fake news, King. 
God, listen to me, King Priam. This is fake news. Do not buy it. And just then, the Trojans find the Greek Sinon, who is hiding in the marshes. And does he have a story? He says things like, oh, Odysseus wanted to sacrifice me to the gods, and I ran away and hid in the marshes and the swamps, and they couldn't find me. I hate them. They're horrible. Please have mercy on me. And so the Trojans are like, wow, you seem to be really upset. I think we believe you. What else you got? He goes, oh, well, you see this giant horse? The thing is, Athena was really mad at Odysseus. Odysseus, because he stole something from her temple. And so when they were going to sail back, they built the giant horse for her so that they could have good luck because he felt really bad and he knew she was mad at him. Well, why did, why did they make the horse so big, Sinon? Uh, well, uh, see, um, we talked to this seer, and the seer said that we had to make it really, really big to show we were really, really sorry. And also the seer said... That if you guys took if the if the horse ever fell into Trojan hands and the and the Trojans took it inside uh, Troy, then the Trojans would win the war and all the Greeks would die. And, oh, also the seer totally said that the Trojans can't burn the horse at all. No, you can't. You can't destroy it because that would lead to your destruction. You would all die. Laocoon hears this and he goes, uh, King. This guy is the definition of fake news. You cannot believe him. This is – are you not hearing this? Am I the only one hearing this? This is not – you can't hear this BS. This guy is just lying. At that moment, Poseidon sends two giant serpents from the sea, and they swallow whole Laocoon and his two sons and disappear. And the – Trojans are looking at this, and King Priam goes, um, I think we're going to bring the horse in. I, I, that guy, Lacoon didn't like the horse, and he got eaten, so let's, let's bring the horse inside, shall we? So they bring the horse. There is a picture of the giant horse. Told you it was really big. It takes a long time, like all day to bring it in. It's a really big horse, and it's really heavy, and they had to pull it by ropes, and it was across sand. So, you know, it took a while. There's how you spell the word lacoon, so, you know, dead, eaten by a uh, giant serpent. And there's also this Princess Cassandra, who's also a seer. Apparently, you can't have too many seers. And Cassandra also is warning them, and she says, I have a premonition. I have seen this. I know it's going to happen. You're all going to die. But the problem is, Apollo sort of cursed Cassandra so that no one would ever believe her, and so all the Trojans just treat her like a crazy cat lady and ignore her. So they wheel the horse into the city. There is a hyperlink that you can watch. It's a two-minute clip from the terrible movie I told you never to watch with Orlando Bloom with his long curly hair um, and looking all serious and bothered because that's what Orlando Bloom does in movies. Um, I don't like Orlando Bloom. Anyway, uh, the, the, if you would like to see a, a clip of the movie, if you don't, just don't click it. So they have a huge victory party. This is a nine-year in-the-making party. Year 10, we throw down. This is an, uh, an epic party, the party of all parties. And everybody gets wasted, and they all start passing out in their drunken stupors. And that's when Sinon gives the signal. And the Greeks drop out of the belly of the horse, run to the gate where their fellow Greeks have come back from their ships and are hiding. All the Greeks run in and they ransack the city. And that's the best word for it because ransack is a word that means pillage and rape and destroy and burn. And that's what they do. They slaughter the men. They cut their heads off. They stab them through the heart. They put their heads on stakes. They kill the slaves. And, oh, yeah, they raped the women. And that's really horrible. And this is actually something you see common in war stories, and it actually carries through historically even to now, that when a victory happens in war, the males that win will often take women um, who they – for the men that they've captured, the women from the other side, and they will brutally rape these women. And they see it not that they're guilty. It's, it's seen as this conquest. It's seen that – these men actually have earned it, that they deserve it. They've, they've 
suffered losses and they fought and now they've won and then so they get to do this and once again it reinforces this horrendous archetype um, that we see of women put in this thing as sex object and as conquests and as rewards for men this is a painting of the burning of troy troy falls they burn it to the ground. They, king, they kill King Priam. He huddles by Zeus's altar, thinking he can pray to Zeus. Zeus doesn't care. Priam gets murdered. They take, his, they take uh, Cassandra, the seer who warned against it. They pull her. She's hiding from, begging from the statue of Athena. They rape her and then kill her, and their blood spills on the statue. They take... King Priam's daughter, Polyxena, they sacrifice her at the tomb they built for Achilles. Achilles is a great warrior who fell. Hector killed him. And so they slaughter um, the daughter of their enemy at the tomb of their fallen hero. And they take then Achilles' killer, Hector. They take his son. They sacrifice him. And these sacrifices of their enemy's children signifies the end of the war. They have burned Troy, they have killed everyone, and now they're gonna go home. 